Great. And never, it, can you see the slides okay? I can. I can hear and see everything. So. Okay. Wonderful. Um, thanks again, Tim, for the invitation. Sorry you have to run, but totally understand. Me too. Um, yeah, well, great. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Natalie Chin. I'm the Climate and Tourism Outreach Specialist at Wisconsin Sea Grant, and I'm based at our Lake Superior field office. So I'm up in Superior, Wisconsin, so a little bit kind of diagonal from where many of you are. Um, so for folks who haven't heard of Sea Grant, my role as an outreach specialist is really to help support research, education, and community outreach about the Great Lakes especially in the Wisconsin portion of Lake Superior is kind of my focus area. So that includes Douglas, Bayfield, Ashland, and Iron Counties. And as Tim was mentioning, my work portfolio touches on many different areas related to climate change and tourism. And this includes some work in accessibility, climate migration, local climate adaptation. Uh, the list goes on and on. I often can't remember everything that I'm working on. So um, it's great though. It's great to have that variety of, of projects. So I'm here today to talk about climate um, and tourism, climate change and tourism, and so I've broken my talk into kind of two parts. The first will focus on work that I've been doing as part of the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts, which maybe you all have heard of already. And then in the second part, um, I probably, or I've just prepared kind of some general reflections on what we can do to travel responsibly, given the intersection between climate change and tourism, as well as other broader social justice issues. So just kind of quick, if folks haven't heard of Wiki, um, this has been a big part of my work over the last few years. Um, and so if you haven't heard of Wiki, its mission is really to generate and share information that can foster solutions to climate change in Wisconsin. And this includes by doing things like developing um, scientific understanding of climate change impacts, helping to identify different vulnerabilities that exist to climate change and climactic variability in the state, and then also just supporting folks around the state with their climate change work, um, including climate change adaptation at the local scale. And Wiki really exists at this intersection between science and climate adaptation and engages with a very diverse community across the state. And this includes um, citizens, public and private decision makers, as well as scientists and researchers. So a little bit of history about Wiki. It was originally formed in the fall of 2007 as a partnership between the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources and the Nelson Institute at UW-Madison. And Wiki published an assessment report back in 2011, which provided a comprehensive overview of how climate change will impact the state. So then back in 2019, so about four years ago now, a new effort was launched to update this 2011 report and provide information to a newly formed governor's task force on climate change, about climate change in Wisconsin. And this new report was released last February. You can find it online. Um, I've included the link below and there's also a QR code if you prefer that. Um, and this new report um, did a couple new things. Um, compared to the 2011 report, in addition to just having kind of the most up-to-date science uh, when it comes to climate change in Wisconsin. Uh, it only exists in electronic format, so that's meant to help make it more um, uh, easier to disseminate as well as easier to update. It also utilizes narratives. Um, so we have a wiki communications director who helped collect many different stories from across the state about how impacts of climate change are already being felt in Wisconsin. And they're really amazing, a really great diverse um, uh, assortment of stories if you're interested in those. There's also a greater emphasis in the report on climate justice, um, including disproportionate impacts to some of um, some Wisconsin communities, including tribes. And the target audience for the report is decision makers, but this is pretty loosely defined. Uh, the report's meant to be accessible to a wide audience. Um, and so decision makers can be anyone who is trying to make decisions based on climate change. Um, and then uh, the last thing, um, the last difference between this new report and the 2011 report is that it talks about climate change adaptation and mitigation strategies. Um, so different ways of adapting to climate change, but also thinking about reductions to uh, greenhouse gas emissions. 
Um, and like I said, you can find the report online. Uh, there's different sections in the report that cover many different um, sectors of um, interest, including agriculture, the Great Lakes, um, uh, plants, and natural communities, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a, a, a plethora, an abundance of, of really great content um, if you're interested in digging into to the report more. And so the reason that I wanted to talk about Wiki is that um, I'm one of the co-chairs of the Tourism and Outdoor Recreation work Working Group. So Wiki's made up of um, about a dozen different working groups that can be kind of loosely grouped under air, water, land, and people. And you'll, you'll find those groupings in the report too if you um, take a look at it. And so our working group is made up of about a dozen, a dozen different members who are spread out across the state who are interested in looking at how, how climate change might impact um, tourism and outdoor recreation. Um, so also on the Wiki website, if you go to our working groups page, you can find a detailed analysis that was completed uh, by our working group to look at how climate change is and will continue to impact tourism and outdoor recreation across Wisconsin. And I'll share some highlights from that report. Um, over the next uh, couple minutes. So just to kind of set the stage for our analysis, we know that tourism and outdoor recreation is very important to Wisconsin. Um, this, these are relatively new numbers that just came out showing the economic um, impact of tourism uh, here at the top. So it's $23.7 billion, um, which is uh, in 2022, which is a 13% growth from 2021. And then if we look at outdoor recreation specifically here at the bottom uh, of the slide, we see that outdoor recreation is about an $8.7 $8 billion industry for Wisconsin. And so major economic impacts, and that's not to mention kind of other benefits um, as far as uh, mental health and um, just the ability to get outside and all of the other wonderful things that come with exploring, um, as I'm sure you all know very well. Um, so when we talk about climate change and tourism and outdoor recreation, uh, one thing to think about is that both um, or these industries are incredibly diverse and encompass a lot of different types of activities and services. So talking about the intersections between climate change and tourism and outdoor recreation can be uh, com complex. So um, let's look at some of the trends that we're seeing in terms of weather and climate in the state. And as we're going through these, I just invite you to think about what they could mean for tourism and outdoor recreation in Wisconsin. Um, so again, some of this might be familiar, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully it's not too much of a repeat from things that you, you already know or have seen before, but we know that, um, that Wisconsin is getting warmer and wetter. And so if you we look here at the two graphs on the left here, we're seeing average annual temperature from the 1890s to 2010s uh, by decade. And then on the right, we're seeing precipitation by decade, um, annual average precipitation. So we can see that um, the, the 2000s and the 2010s um, ha were, were the warmest temperatures, uh, the warmest decades on record for Wisconsin. And then if you look uh, at precipitation, we see that the 2010s were the wettest decade by, for, by far in Wisconsin. And so just seeing in the historical record, uh, the warming and um, increasing precipitation that we're seeing in the state. And then if we break it up by season, um, so here we have uh, trends in uh, temperature from based on climate averages from 1950 to 2020. Uh, for winter here on the top left, and then spring on the top right, summer on the bottom left, and fall in the bottom right, we can see that we are seeing warming across every season. Uh, in the winter, this is kind of the biggest increases in temperature that we're seeing, uh, four to five degrees Fahrenheit, um, but spring also two to three degrees, summer maybe a little less, um, and fall, but we are seeing warming across every season. And then if we look at um, precipitation trends across the state or, or data, precipitation data across the state, we're also seeing that for the, for depending on where you are, um, for the most part, every season is also getting wetter. Um, consistently in the winter, a little less um, consistent in the summer, maybe it's even drying in the Northern part of Wisconsin, um, at least for the summer months. 
uh, but fall as well, getting wetter, and then spring um, a little less um, as well in the northern part of the state, but um, seeing significant increases in, in precipitation uh, from 1950 to 2020. And then the other thing that we're also seeing um, is increases, pretty significant increases in extreme rainfall events. So in the 2010s, there were actually 21 different 100-year um, rainfall events that, are, that affected most parts of the state. Um, and so, um, you know, that's a pretty significant uh, increases. And in, for all of you, maybe you've seen some of the impacts of some of these events um, over the last decade or so. Okay, and then, um, so if you look at kind of what the, what the trends are or what the, the models are projecting through the mid, through mid century, we're also ex expecting um, this warming and wet, uh, warming and getting wetter um, trends to continue. So if we look again at seasonal uh, projections, we see that winter um, significant warming, especially kind of, um, in the northwestern part of the state of six degrees, but also five degrees in the rest. So um, pretty significant warming, especially in the winter, um, spring and fall as well. Summer, maybe a li slightly less um, drastic change, but projected temperature change, we're expecting warming in every season through mid-century. And then if we look at extremes in particular, um, again, uh, on the left, we're seeing kind of averages, the 30 year average for 1981 to 2010 in terms of extreme heat, but then moving into the future, kind of mid-century, um, we're expecting that uh, 90 degree days are likely to triple in frequency statewide uh, through the mid, through mid-century. And we're experiencing some of that right now um, with, with the extreme temperatures that we've had um, over the last few months. And then looking at projected precipitation changes through mid-century um, for Wisconsin across seasons, again, um, maybe a little, little bit less um, increase or less projected change in, in precipitation in the summer, uh, not, a, not as clear of a signal, but in winter and spring, especially uh, warming of um, five to 10% uh, through, through mid-century compared to, to historic data. And that includes for extreme, these extreme rainfall events that, um, that we are talking about. So uh, the, these graphs are showing how two inch daily rainfalls might change um, from historic data through mid-century. Um, and so extreme rainfall, again, isn't expected to increase in the future throughout Wisconsin. So I just, uh, I wanna take a pause there um, and just, um, ask this question. So what do you think some of these trends might mean for tourism and outdoor recreation in Wisconsin? If you want to pop some thoughts in the chat, this seems like a pretty um, active and fun group. Um, maybe throw some thoughts in there and, and uh, let me know what you think that this might mean for tourism and outdoor recreation in our state. Or also, if you want to come off mute and, and share a thought, some thoughts. Yeah. So impacts to skiing, the Berkey, other winter sports. Of course, um, we'll talk about that. And then people looking for more information about where to go and what to do. Yeah, of course. This will have influ effects on um, where people choose to travel in in the future. Um, here in New England, we're, always, oh, we're already seeing shorter seasons for skiing and less vibrant fall leaves uh-huh definitely more tourism from the south sure yep and then milwaukee may not be cooler near the lake yeah so all of these all of these things are going to affect tourism and outdoor recreation for sure okay so um yeah so so all of um all of these things we've we, as a working group we try to understand how um climate change is going to interact with tourism and outdoor recreation. And so I'll go into a little bit more um, detail about some of the things that we looked at um, in the report. And so um, more extreme heat days, of course, these are going to 
lead to more concerns for human health and safety, especially for folks who don't have access to air conditioning. Um, again, the predictions are that, are that the number of extreme heat days could go from zero to 15 to 10 to 40 per year. And this could also lead to increased energy costs, costs for cooling technologies, which affects businesses, uh, tourism businesses, and event organizers. So um, definitely some concerns with extreme heat. Uh, I, I also watched a webinar the other day about kind of the impacts of extreme heat on mental health. Um, and so that just brings in another element if we're expecting uh, many more days that are very hot. And then uh, obviously with an increase in temperature, a uh, decrease in cold days, which somebody mentioned. Um, so projections again are that we're gonna see a decrease of about a month in cold days across the state, um, which also subsequently leads to a shortening of winter. Um, so someone was talking about uh, less time for winter-based recreation and snow and ice related activities. So again, that's something that we're also expecting uh, to be affected by here in Wisconsin. Um, fewer days suitable for snowmaking. Um, so we're expecting to see these days, um, you know, certain conditions are, are ideal for snowmaking, that there's going to be a decrease in the level um, or the number of these days um, that will make kind of business less sustainable, and especially in the southern part of the state. Uh, more freeze-thaw days. So up here, especially, um, you know, in the, in the April, um, in the shoulder season, so in spring and fall, uh, the trails often close because of um, th freezing, freezing and thawing of uh, trails. Um, and so, um, you know, that could definitely have an impact on trail conditions in the future, especially if we're seeing more of these cycles uh, for outdoor recreation. And then someone was talking about shifting seasons as well. So we are expecting to see a lengthening of the shoulder season. So we may talk about shoulder season or thinking fall and spring. This could actually be good for tourism and outdoor recreation because there's more time to do outdoor activities um, than maybe there has been in the past. So, um, the, but something else to think about with this is that we're going to also um, see a decline or projections are suggesting a decline in mild weather days. So these are days where temperatures are between 65 and 85 degrees Fahrenheit um, of about two weeks per year. So um, that also affects kind of opportunities to get outside. But most of these losses will be in June and August where we're going to see those um, hotter temperatures. And then um, warming water temperatures. So this could affect ice, ice cover, of course, which has impacts for fisheries and ice fishing. Um, but maybe that also encourages folks to, to recreate in, in water, um, bodies of water more. So kind of mixed, um, potential for some mixed impacts there. And then looking specifically at precipitation, um, again, these increase in intense rain events and storms is concerning because of potential impacts to safety. And these are events are expected to lead to more frequent floods and washouts, which have effects year round. Um, so up here, you know, there were, there's been major flooding over the last decade, which has happened sometimes in the midst of tourism season. And so that can lead to folks getting stranded, not being able to go where they need to go. Um, also concerned for health and safety. Um, and so those um, are definitely a concern moving forward for tourism and outdoor recreation. And then also due to warming temperatures, we're expecting more winter precipitation to fall as rain and snow. You saw that um, uh, winter is getting wetter, but then with the with the rising temperatures, that means that we, we may see more rain in the winter months than snow. So by the late 20th cent 21st century, we're expecting state average snowfall could be about 50% less than it is now with the greatest effect on snow depth in March and also in the northern part of the state. So that could affect where people are going, um, the opportunities that they have to engage in things like um, someone brought up the Berkey, of course. So that's, um, that's definitely a, a concern for snow-based activities. And then finally, um, kind of these changes in precipitation patterns also interact with lake levels. So in Wisconsin, lake levels are generally expected to become more volatile. So that means swinging from between high and low extremes. Uh, and this, of course, has impacts for coastal resources, public access to coasts, water safety, um, 
and you know we saw some of that uh, recently with kind of these record highs but also record low lows um, in the Great Lakes. So all of these things uh, will inter interact with tourism and outdoor recreation for Wisconsin. We also looked at how um, or, or kinds of impacts how these might vary per by season. So if of course in terms of the summer, summer is Wisconsin's most um, most popular season in terms of tourism. So with climate change, we could see some benefits uh, to recreation because of these warming temperatures, warming water temperatures, maybe folks wanna get outside. Um, of course, there's some mixed impacts there um, with, as with everything, but Wisconsin could gain a uh, competitive advantage compared to other destinations if our tourism season grows. So someone talked about more folks coming in uh, from the South to, to participate in tourism up here. So of course that's something that we could see more of moving into the future. Um, of course, again, uh, extreme heat and damaging storms are concerns, um, and these events can cause significant damage. Um, if folks rec you know, are familiar with Pheasant Branch Conservancy, I know that there was a major storm there um, over the, in the last couple of years, and then also up here, Saxon Harbor, um, major damage to the uh, marina, especially because of those uh, flooding events. In the fall, uh, again, potential for a lengthening season, which could be a good thing, um, but also the potential for a decline in fall colors because of um, changing uh, seasonal shifts. Um, this, these, these shifts could also affect um, species composition in the state natural area. So the kinds of trees and flora and fauna that we're seeing. Um, and then also based on contributions to our report from uh, tribal partners, we know that there are vulnerabilities to uh, for culturally significant spe species from climate change, uh, but in particular wild rice, birch trees, and other kinds of fisheries, for example. In winter, again, we've kind of already talked about many of these. We know that tourism and outdoor rec recreation will suffer and probably suffer the most under climate change, especially any activities that require reliable and significant snowpack or ice cover. So some of the things that folks might think about doing are transitioning to activities like fat, fat tire biking or snowshoeing that don't require as much snow or as, as reliable of snow. And then also using snowmaking technology, um, maybe not, uh, not something that can be, do, can be done over the long term, but it could help offset some losses in the near term. Um, again, it won't be kind of an all encompassing solution but that is something that maybe could help offset, do some offsetting in the near term. And then in spring, uh, again, we expect climate change and changes in climate to affect the availability of species for hunting and fishing, as well as bird behavior and migration. All of these things could change, which could mean that we need to make some different decisions or adjustments in terms of management decisions. Um, as well as thinking about bird watching windows. So well, I know a lot of folks here are interested in birds and like looking for birds. So, um, you know, we might need, we might see changes to those things in the future. Uh, we may also see the appearance of more non-local species, which of course affects um, the ecology, ecology and dynamics of places and then impacts, especially to maple sugaring season uh, because of these uh, changes in climate. So a lot of different potential impacts, many, many impacts, and kind of a mixed bag. So some good, some bad, uh, some maybe uh, more significant or less significant in terms of what could happen with climate change and tourism and outdoor recreation. So next steps uh, in particular for our working group are to think about how um, we can provide more locally uh, relevant information and support to partners in tourism and outdoor recreation. So trying to fill some of that gap, those gaps in terms of uh, information that's needed to help with decision making. Some of the things that we are thinking about are opportunities to fill some of the gaps that, that are in our original report over the next five years, uh, paying attention especially, I think, to um, more in-depth case studies looking at climate change impacts for different areas of the tourism and outdoor recreation sectors. Um, and then also thinking about um, if, if we're representing um, uh, the impacts to these culturally 
uh, significant species or activities? And how do we make sure that we are bringing attention and, and elevating those voices as well as we're moving forward? Um, and then also thinking about how we support other efforts that are kind of going on in the state related to tourism and outdoor recreation and uh, highlighting climate change impacts and thinking about how we can help um, other efforts that are going on. And then again, just, you know, the question is always, uh, we, we see the climate science and we understand what it's saying, but how do we make that most helpful to folks who are actually in the industry trying to make decisions? Um, and if you have ideas, uh, <laughs> we'd be definitely be open to them. Uh, one of our big projects that we're working on right now is to look at how climate change is impacting the downhill ski industry in Wisconsin through interviews with resort operators. And so that's something that is ongoing right now that we're hoping to be able to share in the next few months. Okay, so that, um, that covered much of what I've been working on related to tourism and climate change for Wisconsin. Um, I'm gonna switch gears now just to talk about uh, more broadly about how tourism and climate change interact and how we can travel responsibly given the fact that tourism is a major contributor to climate change, especially because of air travel. Um, so, but before they, we do that, I maybe we'll just pause again and see if there are any questions that folks have um, before I switch and we'll have time at the end too, I know, but. Um, I just want to take a, a moment there to see if any anything has come up that folks want to bring up right now. Hi, Natalie. This is Chris. I'm just going to yeah. jump in because I'm super curious to think about this. Of course, your, your project and your job is really kind of a, a statewide effort, but I'm wondering if there are any special initiatives or components that focus on urban areas, uh, thinking about you know urban heat islands as well as particular impacts on urban communities, if that's if that's really part of this or if it's something everyone's aware of, but it's not really in your scope right now? Sure, that's a great question. I, I would say that that's covered by folks who are involved in Wiki, maybe not specifically with our Tourism and Outdoor Recreation Working Group, though um, I know that, um, well, I shouldn't say that because some of the folks in our working group are looking at biking and kind of heat heat with biking and okay. and trying to develop maps that could be uh, made available to folks to help find kind of safe locations if there's extreme storms or cooling you know uh, water fountains and that kind of thing and I know mm -hmm. some of the maintenance with um, putting together projects like that uh, can be hard to upkeep but that is one thing that comes to mind and then completely separate from wiki um, this wiki work uh, I did try um I was helping to manage a project with um, lacrosse oh. to look at uh, urban heat, and so we had a capstone student, a uh, capstone group at UW Madison, uh, put together some different options for mitigating heat islands for lacrosse. So that's something that there is work going on. It's not exactly related to the tourism and climate change work, but something okay. that I'd be happy to talk about more. <laughs> Yeah, great. I'll, I'll follow up with you on that because, uh, I mean, actually, I would have a capstone group, potentially students, you know, that might have a similar kind of interest. I'd be interested in the model. Cool, cool. And use. there's quite a lot happening in Milwaukee. I know they did like yeah. a citywide map initiative on heat islands sure. um, that someone at DNR led. So, yeah, okay, definitely great. happy to follow up great. about that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah, go ahead. It's slightly different from climate recreation, people coming here to do recreation, but what about just plain migration? Mm -hmm. Yeah, people great question. <laughs> from south to, well, the north, but we're concerned about Wisconsin because that's what they want to do given climate change. Yes, yeah, I was just reading an article today about kind of, uh, you know, Wisconsin keeps being touted as a climate haven, climate refuge, because, well, the idea is that we'll be kind of relatively um, protected from some of the more extreme impacts of climate change. So there is another group in Wiki that started recently looking specifically at climate migration. It's kind of new. It's just, it's only been around for a few months, but that is something that is part of the conversation. Um, and I was also helping out with a workshop for the Great Lakes focused on climate migration. That's part of a, 
a national project. So they held regional meetings in different areas to look at climate migration. And so um, those the, these activities are, are these kinds of efforts and initiatives are getting started uh, for Wisconsin. So another area of interest for sure um, that's being looked at. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Natalie, there's a lot, there's a lot to talk about with migration. Sorry, go ahead, Jenny. <laughs> oh, no, this is, um, and I had to step away for a few minutes, so maybe you've already addressed this, but um, given what's been going on um, out west and in Canada, is there any increased fire risk, um, especially in the Northwoods in Wisconsin, and mm. that translate into more and more emphasis maybe on fire safety and working with utilities and whatnot? Yeah, that's a great question, too. I I don't know that there have been many studies specifically looking in depth at fire risk mm -hmm. in Wisconsin or even uh, the Great Lakes, but I know that, um, or at least I, you know, that is something that we thought about at least with the report that we were working on. Um, I think that relates back to climate migration too. We we have heard anecdotally right. about folks moving over here to try to escape the wildfires, but the wildfire smoke, at least up here in Duluth and Superior, has been really bad this summer because of the Canadian wildfires. So it's kind right. of, um, yeah. I I but I don't know about specific studies looking at wildfire um, for Wisconsin. There probably is some um, out there. That's a good question. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. I guess that smoke also affects the outdoor industry to some extent, even yeah. if the fires mm -hmm. aren't here. Right. Yeah, with air quality and um, yeah, I mean, I felt it uh, this summer too. My eyes were <laughs> probably still are from from ragweed, but um, yeah, definitely feeling the effects of those for sure. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so I just have a few few more slides that I want to share, uh, talking more in depth, kind of more broadly again about how um, tourism and climate change interact. And so, this is more of a uh, general thought exercise that of materials that I found and pulled together uh, to look at tourism and climate change and less um, kind of in depth work that I've been doing. So, uh, yeah, just. A caveat there, but um, this was a really interesting and, and helpful exercise for me because I'm planning a, a trip upcoming. So it was fun to look at resources and information that's available out there to help um, with responsible travel. And I will say that when I've looked for information like this in the past, I haven't found as much, but I feel like there's more out there now. So I think this is an area that's been growing um, and is interesting, uh, or there's interest in. Um, for folks. So before we jump into that, I just want to take a step back um, because I know when we talk about climate change, that feelings of dread and anxiety and helplessness can come up. I certainly feel that way, um, well, often. So I just want to pause with a poem that I found that can kind of help us connect back with the why of travel and kind of offer some context as we um, kind of wrap up the talk today. So I found this poem online. Um, the author is anonymous, but it resonated with me and I just wanted to share it um, as folks who I think probably also enjoy traveling and experiencing different places. Um, and so the title is, Why Do I Travel? It is on the road that my inner voice speaks the loudest and my heart beats the strongest. It is on the road that I take extra pride in my woolly hair, full features and lineage. It is on the road that I develop extra senses and the hairs on my arms stand up and say, Sana, don't go there, and I listen. It's when I safety pin my money to my underclothes and count it a million times before I go to sleep. It is on the road that I am a poet, an ambassador, a dancer, medicine woman, an angel, and even a genius. It's on the road that I am fearless and unstoppable, and if necessary, ball up my fist and fight back. It is on the road that I talk to my deceased parents and they speak back. It's on the road that I reprimand myself and set new goals, refuel, stop, and begin again. It is on the road that I experience what freedom truly is. It is my travel that has transformed me making me a citizen of the world, when my humanness, compassion, and affection are raised to a new level and I share unconditionally. So there's definitely good 
in travel and tourism, which again, I'm sure I don't have to tell any of you. Um, and there are important reasons that we travel, even given kind of the push and pull with climate change. Uh, so I don't think tourism should stop, even though it can have some negative impacts. Um, like I mentioned, uh, significant uh, contributions to uh, emissions because of air travel um, and other other kinds of impacts. Um, and so um, something that came through my email recently uh, that I think highlights a lot of these different issues um, is with the wildfires in Hawaii, um, those, the devastating wildfires that happened last month. And so I, um, I found this quote that I wanted to share because I think it highlights a lot of important questions um, that have that relate to tourism and climate change. Um, it's broader than climate change, but I think that some of these things are going to come up more um, as we as we continue to see extreme weather impacts and climate change impacts on tourism destinations, places that we want to visit. Um, and so it's a lot of text. So I'll just read it really quick, really quickly for all of you. Um, so many local individuals and organizations, including the Hawaii Tourism Authority and the Hawaii Visitors and Conventions Bureau, don't wish to see an end to tourism altogether, but a more intentional regenerative practice. Some of these practices are the responsibility of the islands, like creating a tourism fee, restricting tourist access to endangered coral and vulnerable coastlines, and setting stronger boundaries for new businesses. Others call for tourists to be more mindful of the land, work directly with native-owned travel agencies, hotels and excursions, give directly to tribal funds, and volunteer their time. In a recent article, Malia Sa uh, Sanders noted, uh, notes that instead of understanding how native communities fit into Hawaiian tourism, the question should be, what is tourism's role in our place, and how do we treat, achieve ho'okaolike, true balance. I probably butchered that, so sorry. Um, but I think that this um, passage just brings up some really important uh, points. Um, so one thing, you know, this question of intentional regenerative practice. So uh, regenerative tourism is something that, uh, that I have heard about. So it's kind of this idea of how can tourism help um, give back to the communities where it's taking place um, instead of being extractive. Um, in Hawaii, I've heard you know issues around over tourism. You know how can we uh, shift that um, tourism industry and uh, the way that tourism is interacting with community into something that's more regenerative. And then the other thing that um, I noticed with this um, passage is that uh, some of some of this is a responsibility. Of the destination, or, or you know, the destination can take can take a role in uh, protecting areas, environmental areas, and trying to make sure that um, that uh, people aren't um, that tourism is is benefiting the local community, and also protecting um, important environmental areas. And then there's also responsibility for tourists, um, so folks who are visiting. In, um, you know, the way that we interact with the places that we're going and how we, um, what we choose to support. So some, kind of what Tim was talking about earlier, how do we make sure that we're supporting things in the right way when we travel to a place? Um, and yeah, and then I just really like this last question, you know, how do we achieve true balance in with tourism? Um, and not just with tourism, but more broadly as well. Um, and I think that, you know, thinking about how tourism expands our views and knowledge in a way that we can't get without physically being in a place, you know, that helps us connect as humans and also thinking about, um, you know, motivating us to want to protect uh, the planet. And I think that, um, you know, given that there's an important piece, um, there's an importance of tourism, but, you know, also thinking about our responsibility to, to place. So I don't know, that that's kind of a, a local event. Um, or recent event that I think helps really illustrate in a clear way, um, an important way, kind of some of these interactions between tourism and climate change and other um, issues that are really important to be thinking about. So I, um, <laughs> to, to kind of offer some practical advice, I tried to cobble together uh, some guidelines or, or advice or, or other kinds of 
tips for traveling sustainably that I found. Thankfully, again, this is sort of a, it seems like a hot topic right now, so or some, something where there's a lot of interest. So um, I just tried to, to offer some, some ideas um, for how that, how we think about travel and, and things that we can do to help um, travel more sustainably and think about um, maybe, you know, hopefully redu reduce some of the impact that tourism can have with climate change and other kinds of um, environmental issues. So the first, of course, is do your research. Um, like I said, there's a lot out there. There's a lot of different resources, but also, you know, making sure that we're making, um, supporting the right causes or, or the things that are really um, benefiting places um, and communities. Um, there's also this, uh, the advice with choosing more domestic trips. Um, one piece of advice I heard or I read was that you should explore your backyard, which I don't have to tell of you because uh, you already know how to do that. But, um, you know, I think the idea is here is that domestic trips or more local trips just reduce um, that impact in, as far as uh, greenhouse gas emissions and, and um, impacts on climate change. Um, also traveling to places that value sustainability or need your support. Um, so thinking about instead of going to the most popular um, tourism destinations, thinking about places that do need, um, you know, income from from tourism. I think I saw Puerto Rico as an example of, of one of the locations on the list, just with a lot of um, devastating natural disasters that have happened. Um, that's one of the places where maybe we should try and um, go more to help support uh, communities there. Um, taking longer trips. So I think the idea here is that you would be um, flying less or maybe tr combining trips into to a one trip instead of making, um, you know, lots of transportation costs and that, and that kind of thing. Um, taking advantage of opportunities to give back to locals. So again, you know, thinking about who you work with or who, who you um, who you decide to support um, local businesses when you're in a place um, and just, you know, trying to be conscientious of, of who and what you're doing when you're in a place. Um, staying at accredited accommodations. So there's a new, there's new websites that let you look at um, uh, accommodations that have gone through sort of this certification program, accredited certification program related to um, green kind of sustainability practices. So I, I hadn't seen that before. Um, uh, this particular one. So that's something also that maybe you can consider. Um, finding alternatives to flying, again, reductions in kind of the overall impact of air travel and, and greenhouse emissions, uh, something to think about. Um, and this goes along, the next one kind of goes along with that, I think. So thinking about energy efficient vehicles, um, are there ways to take um, transportation that's less carbon intensive? So uh, maybe train or bus, you know, other kinds of public transportation can be a way of of trying to help um, travel in a more sustainable way. Um, there's also offsetting your journey by giving back. So I know there are mixed reviews on, on kind of carbon credits and carbon offsets, but this can also be um, going back to kind of volunteering or donating to causes that um, maybe you learn about on your, on your travel and uh, want to give it back in that way. Um, Packing light, I think this is just, um, a, a, you know, kind of less weight, less um, less uh, energy required to move. So that's just uh, um, something to think about as well. And these last three, I mean, these are probably things that you've already you're already doing or thinking about doing, but just trying to incorporate some of these uh, good practices into uh, the travel that you're doing as well. So reducing plastic or consumption of single use products, maybe by bringing your own utensils or uh, napkins or, or other kinds of things. I, I saw suggestions for that. Um, thinking about ways of making more sustainable food choices. So again, supporting um, local uh, businesses, but also maybe choosing not to eat meat or, or, or trying to just reduce your um, impact way, that way. And then finally, just buying conscientiously. So we, we talked about that already, but um, you know, maybe there's a uh, uh, instead of buying souvenirs, there's other kinds of experiences or a way to, to um, support your travel or, or to take advantage of uh, being in a place that can um, reduce consumption. Um, so I don't know, just some just some food, food for thought. Take it, take, hopefully there's something useful in here that you can take with you on your own travel. I'm sure that I'm going to be thinking about it. So um, yeah, uh, you know, everybody's different. Everybody has... Uh, 